Yeah, so Mary, so uh, I asked everybody who I had on the show, like, you know, how things started, you know, what age and how the junior years went until you turned pro. I know with you it was super quick until you turned pro, but maybe you can guide us a little bit through how it started and how you found your passion for, for tennis. Yeah, sure. I just saw Elena connected. I want to say hi to Elena. <laughs> uh, I see my friends are popping yeah, up. Yeah, so you go ahead. So cool. That's what I love about the lives. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so I actually wanted to be a pediatrician when I was like seven years old, I think. Um, and I wasn't into sports like at all. <laughs> and then I was 10 years old, I was in Florida. Um, is my phone okay? Hold on. How's yeah. it? Like I, I knew you well. Okay. <laughs> um, good. So yes, yeah, so I was in Florida, 10 years old, and just followed one of my really good friends from school. I went to the club. She had a lesson. I was just watching. And someone just said, hey, um, you know, do you want to play? And I was like, okay, sure. They said, well, grab your racket and jump on the court. I'm like, well, I don't have a racket. And they're like, okay, we'll get one in the pro shop and go on the court. So I went to the pro shop and I asked the lady for a racket. And she's like, well, what do you usually use? I said, I don't know. I've never played. She's like, oh, okay. So she <laughs> gave me a racket and she pointed me to a court where um, – there are these kids half my age and the coach was there like showing them how to hold the racket, hand tossing them the ball. They swing, they totally miss it. They didn't even touch the ball. And I got to this court. I'm like, I don't want to go on this court. I want to go over there where all the kids are running around and <laughs> hitting and playing and hi, Aaron. Um, and basically I hit the ball as the first ball that the coach um, tossed to me, I hit it and I hit it over the net. And the coach looked at me and he's like, who told you to come here? I said, well, the lady in the pro shop, He's like, no, 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 um, you're on the wrong court. Go to the next court. Yeah. Um, <laughs> bonsoir to all my French fans. Um, so then I went to the next court. And on the second court, I was there for like five minutes. And the coach was like, who told you to come here? I was like, well, <laughs> That's funny. And, then I <laughs> and you went to the next one. <laughs> and I stayed on the third court. And it was about 45 minutes, half an hour, whatever, later. And I finished. And I walked off. And I tried to go find my friend. Rachel, who was playing, and um, a coach came up to me, a very tall, thin man, and he says to me, hi, my name is Kevin. I'm the head pro here, and I've never <laughs> my club before. Hi, <laughs> Jules. <laughs> my little cousin. Um, so, um, and he's, he's like, yeah, how old are you? How long have you been playing? Where are you from? Et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, I'm Mary. I'm from here. I'm 10 years old, and I've been playing about 45 minutes. And he's like, no, no, but how many years have you been playing? I was like, well, no, it's my first day. He's like, okay, come back with your parents tomorrow. So I came back the next day with my parents and I just waited. They chatted and they just said, okay, Mary, you're going to start playing tennis now. Um, just like your friend Rachel after school, three times a week for an hour. So that's what I did. I started playing wow. at 10 years old, three times wow. a week for an hour after school. And a few months later, they're like, okay, Mary, you're going to play tournaments now. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like to compete because I didn't want to beat anybody. Like, I felt so bad. So I was playing That's with so friends. Funny. I was like, oh, no, I felt so bad. But, um, yeah, and, like, two years later, I was number one in Florida, number one in America, oh. won the national championships, lost in the finals of the Orange Bowl, was number two in the world. And then, wow. yeah, 13 years old, my dad was like, that's it. No more junior tennis for you. You're going to play pros. We moved to France. That's where my mom is from. She's French. And uh, my dad is from America. And so we lived in France in the summer, Florida mm -hmm. in the winters, and played all the that's French the, that's, tournaments. That's not bad. <laughs> yeah, no, it was great. And then yeah. at 15, I started playing professionally. So wow. that's that's unbelievable. That's unbelievable. Like, in four and a half years of tennis, like, that's – you know, that's, but you know, when, when we see kids we teach here and, you know, and then it's, it's un unbelievable, unbelievable in four years, you know, like, so, so that was one of my questions, you know, like, yeah. since you, since you became professional so early, what did that do with you in terms, you know, like, obviously, you know, you're still, you're still a kid with 14 and then you have to play all the older, the, the young ladies and, 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 and the women on, on tour. But, like, what did that do with your own court and your game? How did you have to adjust? And off court as well, obviously, like, on a personal level, you know? So, because there are a lot of changes, I guess, so. Yeah, that's um, that's a good question. Um, you know, I my dad coached me, um, you know, pretty early on in my tennis. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, he always told me, just hit the ball as hard as I can. So, and he's like, you know, don't worry, it'll come in one day. <laughs> and so when I arrived on the tour at 14 years old, I was, um, I was hitting the ball pretty hard. You know, even though I was young, I was physically yeah. strong. Um, someone from Iran watching, that's cool. Yeah, all over the world. That's why I love, that's why that's, I love the internet. It's so well connected so and people get a chance awesome. to see that. Love it. Um, I've actually never been there. I've been to Jordan, I think. But um, anyway, <laughs> so um, yeah, so my dad coached me to hit the ball super hard. And so when I arrived on tour, I was I was a hard hitting, aggressive player. So, you know, someone like uh, Steffi Graf was on mm -hmm. tour and was driving. She had a big forehand. Um, then there was Monica Sellis, who had two hands on both sides, powerful from both sides, swinging volley. So that was my my type of game, you know, hard hitting, you know, mm -hmm. very aggressive. Um, so I think my game adapted very well um you know from early on yes. on tour against those type of players at that time when i arrived in 89 there was a lot of one-handed players serving mm -hmm. volleyers um so my game matched up really well um, with them you know on an emotional side it was tough because i was 14 um sarajevo this is so cool hi <laughs> um and you know being a young girl thrown into an adult world really mm -hmm. um you know you think i'm i'm working now i'm 14 years old I'm, this is my job <laughs> this is my career I started at 14 <laughs> years old and i'm with adult women um it's not easy because i guess you're expected to behave like an adult but you're not you're mm -hmm. a kid you know you're a teenager yeah um so it wasn't easy and also you know being taken out of school at 13 years old i finished and i got my high school diploma i continued through correspondence courses but that was really, really hard for me because I love school. And friends. And, you know, friends. there's no more friends. You know, you're yeah. all down the court. You're all day training. Like from 13 years old on, I was training about eight hours a day yeah. and fitness. So there was no time really for anything else. So I missed not having friends, playing with my friends. Um, and, you know, the lifestyle is tough. You know, you're traveling a lot and we're in the yeah. car a lot, hotels a lot. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't easy. There's was a lot of sacrifices for yeah. sure um, that I had to make early on at a young age. And my family too, you know, and my brother, yeah. who's 15 months younger than me, were very close in age. And so his life was kind of, you know, sacrificed in a way because he had to follow along, <laughs> you know, everywhere we went and what we did. So, But on the other side, it opens so many doors as well, right? So it's like, you know, the, you know, I traveled and played, not a, obviously not the level you did, but you know, it opened so many doors and you met, you meet so many pe people, you get to see things you usually don't see. And it was funny when, when I talked to Paul Anico and, you know, talking about traveling about Sempras and Federer, you know, it said like Sempras is like laser focused and just focused on the tournament. And Federer is the guy that likes to go to art, to museums with the mm. family, you know, so everybody is different in, in that sense. But uh, yeah, but I guess, you know, opened many, many doors. Well, for sure. I mean, nothing great in life comes easy. It takes yeah. great, great, great things, <laughs> sacrifices and hard work um, to achieve really anything great in life, no matter what it is that you want to do and achieve. Um, there's always going to be hard work. There's always going to be sacrifices. You need yeah. to be disciplined. Um, you know, there's a great price to pay yeah. um, to achieve great things. But at the end of the day, like it's all so, so worth it because you know, I think back to my career and how just incredible and how amazing it was. Um, it was far beyond what I could have ever imagined. You know, my dream was to win Roland Garros and I won that and the doubles the same year. Plus I made two other that's, finals. That's what I wanted to mention. Like Kafelnikov <laughs> did in 1996, you did in um, 2000, 2000, right? Yeah, 2000. Exactly. Was. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, it's those moments that you, you train so hard for all of those years. You know, you think I started tennis at 10, and I won rolling um, 25. That's 15 years of blood, yeah. sweat, and tears. Yeah. That's a long yeah. time. Oh, it is. Oh, definitely. Dream to come yeah. true. But let me tell you, when it does, it's all worth it. So tell, tell us, I wanted to ask you that. 2000, you know, you're in the final. You worked your whole life. As you said, you wanted to win that tournament. Tell us a little bit, but what I like to ask the players always, because usually you don't get that inside. So you play Conchita Martinez. Mm -hmm. so, what was your game plan? Because, you know, when I asked like guys at Mark Philippos, Mark just said, you know, the war when I, when my serve was on, my forehand was on, I don't care if there's Federer or whoever, you know, like, so he was, you know, he beat those guys because that was his game. What was your game plan when you went in there? 
Um, Do you I remember? Had, <laughs> the finals against Conchita? Yeah. Or, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, you know, I had played Conchita, you know, quite a few times. We knew, we knew each other pretty well. Um, her serve was pretty tricky because she had a really low toss. and It was a really kind of quick motion. And I knew that um, her clay was obviously her best surface. Mm -hmm. um, well, she played well on grass too, <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, you know she's a very good, you know, being Spanish clay court player, and she's got a kind of a tricky slice serve. Um, but I knew that her second serve was weak, um, her kick mm -hmm. second serve. So m I really wanted to take advantage of any second serves that I had I on both sides, forehand and backhand. Yeah, to attack, and you know, hit mostly to her backhand because she had a one-handed backhand. And I liked playing against players that had a one-handed back because I felt like I had an advantage um, that was a weaker side. And if, you know, if she hit tops in or if she sliced, mm -hmm. I felt like I was ready for it. And I knew that she liked the drop shot and she had a good drop shot. So I had to be on, on the lookout for that. Um, but mostly playing her backhand side and, you know, hitting the short cross-court angles to open mm -hmm. up the court. Mm -hmm. and then I had the whole court open because she did really well when she would run around her, forehand, um, her backhand and her forehand. That was her best shot, her inside out. So I wanted to really make sure to keep it way over to her backhand side. And then I could open up to the forehand side and just be aggressive, like coming mm -hmm. forward as much as possible, you know, finishing the ball at the net. And even um, the high, heavy ball tops mm -hmm. it to the backhand side because with one hand, it's hard to hit it. Yeah, hard and to hit it off there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if she would give me a high ball, then I would come in and take it in the air as a swinging volley. So, and a lot of kick serves to her backhand and to her backhand body. Um, you know, that was, that was what I was, you know, my game plan going into that match. And then when did you usually talk about game plans? I know your brother coached you. And then like what, what, when, like a uh, couple, when was it, 2000, 2005? Yes, my brother was my coach in 2000, 2005. My two, so, pretty much two of my best years. Yeah. So how, so when when did you guys, usually the night before? Well, how did you do that? Like, you know, like when, when game plan and strategy and how, how does a day look like of a final? Maybe you can just a little, just a little bit. Maybe you can talk Ooh, a little bit. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, hopefully you've had a good night's sleep. Yeah. Uh, and you weren't too nervous and you slept well and you woke up, um, you know, feeling refreshed. But, you know, you usually wake up and you've got butterflies in your stomach already because yeah. it's finals day. You just feel like something in the air is different. Um, you just try to stay focused and just try to stay as calm as possible and, you know, in your routine and relaxed. Um, so, you know, like wake up, have breakfast, mm -hmm. get, get ready, go over to the site. Um, I had a pretty bad shoulder injury before Rolling Garros. I didn't even know if I was going to play the tournament. So I had to do a lot of treatment before I could even warm up. Um, so I'd go and do that. And then I would do my warm up, you know, my dynamic stretching, mm -hmm. jump rope and whatever. Have a hit. Not too long. Um, Maybe 20 minutes, 20, half an hour. 20 minutes, something mm -hmm. like that. You know, I didn't need a lot, a lot of hitting by that point. <laughs> I played a lot of tennis. You just want to basically be fresh and keep yep. your energy. Um, then, you know, go back and, and have a shower, get in your match clothes, um, have something to eat, you know, like some carbs. At the time, that's what I ate, like rice or something like that. Mm -hmm. I had an hour and a half before mm -hmm. I would play um, with olive oil. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, uh, I liked it. And then, um, and then just put my feet up, relax, mm -hmm. listen to some music, um, do some visualization, just be relaxed and quiet mm -hmm. alone. Um, and then about, you know, probably an hour before I would uh, go to the trainer, get my mm -hmm. shoulder warmed up, and then do my whole routine, um, you know, dynamic stretching, warming up, get the blood flowing, get a sweat broke, mm -hmm. do some shadow shots um speak to my coach you know just like the last minute things mm -hmm. you know strategy tactics just that things are clear very simple not mm -hmm. a lot of information um and then just before going on court i would pray and just go out in peace and looking forward to having fun and giving 100 percent of myself and enjoying the moment nice and then how the last game like i don't remember exactly who served did you serve or did she serve when you I served. So you served. So how heavy did the arm get the last couple of points? <laughs> I think that I think I won on my third match point. <laughs> oh. So I was definitely the second set was six, was seven five. So I was definitely getting a bit tight. 
uh, towards the end, you know, and I was trying not to think that it was Roland Garros and not to think that my dream can come true in this one point if I win it. And I actually had to start tricking my myself in my mind um, at the end. I just had to go and think, okay, I'm serving. It's just another game. It's like three, two, you know, just, just one, just one game, you know? And, um, you know, then I have like to say, okay, now you only have to win four points um, and count down like that. And then when I lost a couple of match points and I was like on my third match point, I basically uh, just said to myself, okay, Mary, just think like it's another point. Like it's just 30, 15, you know, <laughs> and uh, try to trick yourself in your mind so that you don't yeah. get too, too tight, <laughs> too nervous. And then when you win it, it's like, and you hear game set match and you're just like, oh wait, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. You know, and then like you look back at your body like this, this, like I can't believe it. I can't believe I did it. I did it. Yes. <laughs> wow. And then in 1995, when you were younger, you were like what, 20 years old in 1995. Correct. So you pl you played a good friend of mine, like the Sanchez family. I'm good friends with Emilio and Arancha, and mm -hmm. uh, so you beat Arancha there. So. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm good with good friends with Arancha um, today. Yeah, she's she's we're phenomenal. Perfect. She went last year. She came to my, I organized tennis conferences. So, you know, Emilio and Arancha spoke as well. And, and uh, yeah, just, just, uh, I love them. They're, they're, especially a good relation bond with Emilio. He's a fantastic family. Yeah. So how was that? How, how did you go into that one? Just. Well, the 1995 Australian Open final um, was different. Like, well, my first Grand Slam final was the, the French in 94. Yeah. When I was 19. Um, and I was very nervous for the French Open final. Um, mm -hmm. I couldn't sleep the night before. I was so nervous about my speech that I had to do in French more than anything. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and that final had to be played over two days because of rain. So it was like two nights that I pretty much didn't sleep and I was so nervous. So <laughs> I learned a lot when I got to the final um, of the Australian Open in 95. I was there with my coach at the time, Sven Grunefeld, and my uh, strength and conditioning coach, Jose Rincon. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the night before the finals, I think they could tell that I was obviously nervous and stressed. And so they're like, OK, let's um, let's let's just do something different after dinner. Let's do something fun. I was like, OK, <laughs> so they're like, let's go play laser tag. And I was like, <laughs> Like, that's, so, what? that's so cool. That's why I love those those lies. You hear things you you would never. Think. Yeah, that's good. That's like good. I was like so shocked. I was like, I didn't expect <laughs> anything like that at all, you know? And they're like, yeah, there's a place across the street. Let's go for half an hour and play laser tag. I was like, sweet. <laughs> so so we went and it was awesome. And I don't think I, I don't know if I'd ever played laser tag before, but you know, we're in there and we're running around and there's other people playing and. You know, of course, you're being careful. You don't want to get injured the night before a final. Yeah. It's getting crazy. But it was so much fun. And it, and when you're doing it, like, you're just focused on that because you don't want someone, like, to shoot you with the laser. And so, you're, <laughs> you know. So, <laughs> so, basically, your mind is completely on one oh. thing. And it's just the laser tag. It's on nothing else. So it takes your mind yeah. completely off of the event and where you Dress are. Dress before, happy. yeah. So it just took my mind off of it totally. And we had fun. And after that, I was so relaxed. And it was a great time. And you know, it helped, you know, um, for, for the next day. And then I learned like, okay, Mary, you know what, if you're going to be nervous, if you're going to be afraid, if you're going to, you know, you're not going to play your best tennis and you're not going to win. So, yeah. and I played Arancha before and I lost to her in the, in the French open final. And I knew why, mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay, I don't want to do that again. Um, and so, yeah, I learned <laughs> to be more aggressive and not to be so afraid. Um, and then helps experience. There's nothing that takes the place of experience. You know I mean? I played uh, first final. This was my second one, so I kind of knew a little bit more to expect emotionally afterwards with the whole ceremony and the speech and everything. So I was better prepared. Nice. And wait, did you play laser tag at when you won the French too? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's like, you know, that's what you think about tennis. You know, it's nothing's nothing's exactly the same. You know, and I mean, I'm I wasn't really superstitious or anything, so it's not like I had to do the same thing all the time, but. It just depends how you're feeling and what you're going through. And I think that's what makes a great coach as well is that they're able to adapt. They're able to yeah. know their players, see their player, read them. How are they doing? What do they need? And adapt. You, know, you can put a plan together, but you're flexible and it can change in either way because whatever the player needs to be able to perform at their best. And for everybody, that's different. And a great coach will know 
what that is and how to get the best out of their player. And it's different for everybody. Yeah. Montar, you um, all right. What else do we have? We had those two grand slams. Oh, so yeah, all, all the women you played, like Hingis, Sanchez, Sharapova, Anna, Kleisters, Graf, Selesh, Navratilova, I mean, unreal. So that, that era was unreal. How do you, what, what do you think, like in our, in our days right now with the ladies, you know, with having Ashley Barty out there, a couple of young guns, uh, you know, like how, how do you, how do you, what the change you think, you know, over the, over the years when you play to compare to the game a little bit today? Um, I mean, you played already yeah. aggressive. You had a great serve, you know, fast four. And I see a little bit coming back now that the ladies start to slice a little bit more, come into the net. You know, the game seems to have, you know, drop shots. Like, it seems a little bit more that there's a, a lot of, you know, finesse coming back a little bit, you know? Yeah, like I said a little bit earlier, like when I came on tour, there was a lot of the one-handed backhands, mm -hmm. the serve and volley players, the slice, you know, chip and charge. Um, then it got into a lot of like the power hitting, the baseline game, um, you know, Monica and Jennifer Capriati, Lindsay Davenport, Mia yeah. Sharapova, um, you know, just power tennis, Venus, Serena. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, yeah, I, I guess you could say there's a bit of bit of variety, a little mm -hmm. bit, you know, with Ashley Barty especially, who's who changes it up and can do a lot of different things on the court, change the pace. She's not afraid to come to the net. I think mm -hmm. that was one thing I think for me that I was missing the most was just, um, you know, not not seeing any serve in volley or any players coming to the net. Mm -hmm. uh, now you start to see it a little bit, you know. Um, not that there necessarily needs to be a serve and volley player, but maybe, you know, coming to the net a bit more yes. and for all around game. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like we're starting to see that more um, now, um, which is what I've been missing um, when I watch tennis, basically. So I'm happy to see that starting to come back a little bit. And then how is your involvement still in tennis, uh, Mary? Like, do you... Are you still involved, like, in, in, on tour or, like, any way, like, teaching or uh, consulting or do you do anything? Yeah, so I did some coaching and some mentoring for a few years, mm -hmm. and I really, love, um, I really love being on the court and helping players because um, I feel like what I've been through in my tennis um, mm -hmm. career can benefit and help someone else. And I really feel, um, you know, where I could be most beneficial is helping a player that wants to win a Grand Slam tournament because that's what I've done and that's what I believe I've experienced in and I can help those players to achieve that. And sometimes it's just in really small things or details. Um, so I enjoy the mentoring part. Um, I'm currently on the board of directors of the ITF. I'm the female mm -hmm. representative. Um, you know, I'm on different committees and mm -hmm. commissions. Do you, do you um, still still very involved? In, in, yes. In, in, in. So how do we get more female coaches like what do you think we have to do because i think i think uh you know i work i work with a, we have we had like we have two female coaches and they're fantastic and i think you know it's missing that we need more more ladies out there coaching so how do we get them out there yeah thank <laughs> you for bringing that up i agree a hundred percent um i believe that i would love to see more women coaches i think um you know, we need to make make room and make space um, for those uh, women coaches. Hi, Susie. Bonjour. <laughs> um, you know, women women coaches can do a great job. I mean, you have yeah. Christina Martinez, yeah. who's on the WT tour. You have Amelie Moresmo, um, yeah. Coach Andy Murray, and now uh, Luca Pui. So, you know, women women can do a great job coaching tennis in all different levels. You know, starting. Yeah, it's what I wanted to say. Not just the little kids. No, no. Exactly. Like I'm talking about like great players as well, obviously, yes. and like you know all the levels. Exactly, and so I think we need to open our mentality yeah. um, in the world of tennis um, and see that women um, are just as able and just as capable yeah. as men are for coaching. Yeah. Um, so. The mentality needs to change in men, players, and in the tennis world, clubs, um, federations, Organizations. whatever it is, you know, just to just to open the door and make a space yeah. for women to be there. And, you know, I'm all about giving the job to the best person. If it's yeah. a man, if it's a woman, yeah. if it's white, 
if they're black. Yeah, if it doesn't like, matter. It doesn't matter, yeah. but let them have an opportunity to be able to have that job, you know, and don't hire someone just because of their gender or because of their color or, yeah. you know, so just to open the door and, and to be fair. So I think that's number one. And guys, I think need to change their mentality too, because, you know, ah, je <laughs> um, guys need to change their mentality too and think, oh, I can't be coached by women. Well, why not? You know, I think yeah. Andy Murray Yep. Hats off to him because, well, why was he open to it? Because his mom, Judy, coached him. Yeah. You know, not his dad, his mom. Yeah. And then he was open for a female coach. Why not? He's had male, he's had female. He just wants the best fit for him personally. And he took Emily Marezma. And I think that really opened the door to show, you know what? A woman can coach yeah. a high-ranked ATP player as well, yeah. you know? Um, so I think it's just whoever is the best fit for that player, um, definitely. But And also for women – to know that yes, if you want to be a coach, it is possible. You know, you can um, also be a coach if you're a woman. You know, and just but the mentality definitely needs to change because it's definitely very um, male, very masculine. Um, yeah, I mean, we're in 2020. It should it should look. You know, we're not anymore like in Stone Age, right? So things should change. Hopefully, you know, like and the uh, yeah. you know and me. Yeah. You know, I'm so I'm so thankful. You know, because I, I, you know, always worked. We have always ladies in our team, and you know, and it's it's just uh, things very important. And good, another good friend, friend Sarah Jane Stone. You know, with WTCA, you know, she tries to make a change, and the whole team. You know, and I, I think it's so important. And hopefully, when people watch this, you know, to to fight for that, we have more more female instructors. And another thing as well. If you look at the stats, I don't know how it is in Europe. I live now since 10 years here, but a lot of girls drop out at the age of 15, you know, while the guys still play. You know, it's another thing when you look at the dropout rate, they drop out after 14, you know, 70, 60 percent or something. It's crazy. So there is another point, I think, where coaches have to do a better job to keep the girls interested in playing, you know, until they're like 18 and then they can decide if they want to go college or pro or like just play it for health reasons. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, you know, I think we need to see, like, why are girls dropping out of tennis or dropping yeah. out of sports around that age? Um, we want to keep it something that's fun for them if it's not going to be something that they're going to do as a career, but also that they continue doing it as a sport because it's healthy. It's good for you to exercise yeah. sports, and it's fun, you know, so to keep them engaged um, in tennis, um, you know, for a longer time. Um, and then – you know, definitely, like I said, um, there's many different jobs you can do in tennis, and, and coaching is, is definitely yeah. one of them, and it's very satisfying as well, you know. Yes, to give back, and, you know, you change lives when you coach. Mary, I have one more question. I know we, we're almost on, on time. I have yeah. one more question. Like, one one or two, one, fav one favorite drill or anything you like to do on court, like anything that comes to your mind, any games or, you know, I always ask the guys because I try to have a little book and when yeah. I'm done, I did like 60 lives now. So I want to have a tiny book I can just send out to people that, that would ideas, you know, did you do yeah. any, anything special you, you remember like, or yeah, any fun yeah, drills? Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Great question. So the first drill that comes to my mind is uh, called the Colombian suicides. Oh, <laughs> and um, because I had a coach, his name was Herman Aguero. Now he's uh, passed away, but um, he's from Colombia. Mm -hmm. And we used to train with him, I guess, when I was like 14, 15, like on clay. Mm -hmm. And um, my dad didn't let me, you know, he coached, my dad coached me from 10 to 18. And he only let a select few coaches work with me. And so Herman was one of them. Which is and, good. And, yes. And so Herman would take like that big shopping cart, you know, where you in America you do groceries with the big shopping cart. <laughs> <laughs> the Sam shopping cart. Yes. And he would <laughs> fill it with tennis balls. So there had to be at least like 500 balls in there. I don't know how many. And he would stand on the service line and you would stand on the same side of the court on the baseline. And so uh -huh. think about it. This is 30 years ago. Yeah. No one was doing hand tossing 30 years ago. This is where it all started with Herman Aguero, then my dad, then my brother. We used to do this on the tour. No one was doing hand tossing and everyone was looking at us like, you're crazy. That's weird. That's like for babies and for beginners, but everybody does it now. You yeah. know, it's so yeah. funny. So Herman did the whole basket and he would toss it side to side. And basically you're sliding on the clay from like mm -hmm. side to side. I mean, you know, you can do as many as you want, but like, 
Colombian suicides because it's just like it would just kill you, you know. You oh man. But Wait, did you did you hit the ball actually, or just caught it and tossed no, it back? No, no, no. He oh, would okay. hit it. You'd run over to your, you'd slide, you hit the yep. forehand, and as you're hitting the forehand, he'd toss the next toss one, the so then you have the next. So you're basically just doing side to side, hand tossing from the service line. Wow. And it was like, it was intense. It was a killer. But what my dad used to do um, is he used to do like 10, 15, 20, 25, 20, 15, 10. Okay. So that That's was pyramid kind of, style. of what we used to do. Of wow. Those, yeah. And it makes you like super strong legs, sliding. Like, yeah. Everything. Um, just, yeah. Mental part as well. You can't give up. Yeah. Let you go. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Well, no, I love that one. I'm going to add that one. I, I, I don't know if I ever did more than 25, but uh, I, I will try. Uh, all my students, you, they, they can blame you for that now. So I'm going to tell them, hey, guys, t tomorrow, 30 balls before and back end. I like that. But, but yeah. And you can, and you can, you know, what's great about that drill is you can vary how you toss it. You can toss it very quick and very close to them. So it's fast. Or low or high. Higher, lower, farther, wider. Yeah. So, so you can work on everything. Offense, defense, you can work. That's, oh, I love that. I love that. And I, well, Mary, I can't thank you enough. That that was awesome. The time went, uh, flew by. And, it was uh, a pleasure. Thank you, you. I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed it as well very much. You're a wonderful person. And I can't thank you and your team, you. You um, your management team. The lady was super nice. And uh, thank you for, like for doing this. <laughs> You're welcome. God bless you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and to everyone connected, thank you for having connected.